Greetings, church family. This is Pastor Steve. Share a message with you today. Uh, we're looking toward a important weekend in the Christian tradition. I hope you're all doing well and miss you. Wish we could be together, but uh, we can celebrate still uh, this way. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, living, dying for us, and then rising so we can walk in newness of life and that you can be our God and we can be your people. Thank you for all the life that you give to us and the, the help that uh, we are receiving from you through this time. Be with our church family uh, and our church abroad. Be with our world. Be with our nation. And uh, I pray that you'll anoint your word today as we look at it and as we learn from you. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of my remarks is, If Christ is Not Risen. This is not a statement of doubt. It's really using Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection chapter of the Bible. And this is what Paul says. Now, if Christ be preached, verse 12 in chapter 15, but now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. So Paul says that if Christ is not risen, then our faith is in vain. So what is the big deal with Easter? in the resurrection. Well, I believe that the doctrine of the resurrection has everything to do with our faith. It is the foundation of our faith. So we ask the question rhetorically, as Paul asked it, what difference does it make what we believe about the resurrection? Remember the adage, you never miss the water till the well runs dry? Well, let's just pretend for a moment, drain our spiritual well and look at where we would be without the promise and hope of Jesus' resurrection. How bleak it would be. What if Christ was not risen? Does the belief in the resurrection make a difference to a Christian? What if it had stayed Friday all weekend, that weekend long ago? Well, the first bullet in my thought today is that without the resurrection of Christ, we would be a people without hope. We would have no hope. We will look at some of the other reasons that Jesus gives us hope in a minute, but I'm talking about the, not the reasons for hope, but I'm talking about hope itself, the attitude, the emotion of hope, the, the, the mental uh, act of hope. We are prisoners of hope. We don't want hope to disappoint us. The resurrection is not just a belief about the past. Like the second coming of Christ, it is a blessed hope for the future. The world around us is in many ways depleted in the area of hope. Sometimes I think if I could not see anything positive ahead, I would soon die. The human spirit needs hope. Sadly, Big Bang cosmology and evolutionary philosophy that the world gives us doesn't paint any rainbows on our horizons. The way our world is going doesn't really either. I've been writing some on astronomy, and in my research, I've been wallowing in the uh, common view and the dismal and fatal view that popular science gives our planet and our universe. The prevailing view is that our entire universe is in a, a slow meltdown. Germane to the current theories of astrophysics is the idea of heat death. Everything is melting down from one form of energy to another. Every star, every sun, every aspect of life is all slowly dying and they will all burn out in the end and in this indefinite future out there and it will leave us all lonely and desolate. 
We are nothing but a spurt of energy that is ultimately doomed to oblivion. A tiny flicker of a flame that will be blown out and all will be darkness and emptiness in the end. How awful. Thankfully, this is not the Christian message. God has promised us all the heavenly riches in Christ. He's offered us a whole lot more, something better than just oblivion. It's pretty amazing what steps people are making to entertain hope in their futures. I don't know where they get hope if they don't find it in Christ. Recently, I noticed an article about a soccer stadium in Europe where you can buy a burial plot. No, not a cemetery. No, this is at the stadium. So you, you know, have your favorite team and you can be buried uh, beside the playing field. Uh, there's a special place for you so that you can be close to your team. Uh, it says here in the article, the final resting place offers fans who have left their earthly life the chance to hear how a match has ended. <laughs> the cemetery, which took a year to lay out, allows deceased supporters a feeling of being present even after death. <laughs> you know, I wonder how that works. Uh, so they have these grave plots and they're modeled on the soccer stadium and they have a concrete goal guarding the entrance and the grass used is part of the original arena's um, pitch. There are several slogans and you can get, you know, a coffin painted with the logo of the team and, and um, here it says, the undertaker who arranges the service chooses the slogan, true passion knows no final whistle to advertise his football burial package. Uh, he also promises that the coffins will be covered with soil that has been played on when they are lowered into the ground. Now, how much comfort do you think that will really bring to the deceased? Uh, but people are going crazy. They want to buy up these plots so that they can be buried next to their favorite uh, football team. How bizarre. Some places in America you can now be buried, like in a Detroit uh, Tigers uniform or with your team's logo on your crypt um, or your favorite brand of sports equipment painted on your coffin. But freely, really, friends, is this really something that would give home and, home and cover to you in the future? It's really kind of crazy. My brother shared with me a few years ago a, a story about a wealthy man who was buried in his Cadillac he had it arranged that a crane would lower him into the ground along with some of his other prized possessions. As this was taking place, a bystander was watching the whole scene and quite overwhelmed about the show of a luxuriance and affluence. Uh, he, he blurted out, impressed by what he was seeing, he said, wow, that is really living. Oh, yeah, really living? That's really dying. There was a rabbinic saying that said there are no pockets in a shroud. You can't take it with you. You have to find hope in something else and something better. And I would like to suggest that you can find it in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the place for hope. We can believe and today uh, take into our very beings the idea of hope in Christ. The second thing that comes to my mind, what if, you know, there were no resurrection? Uh, perish the thought. But uh, if there's no resurrection, and Paul builds on this in this passage, that if there's no resurrection of Christ, then there's no resurrection or reunion with our loved ones, people that have gone before us. Paul reasons this way, that if there's no resurrection of Christ, there's no resurrection of our loved ones that the resurrection of Christ is the coupon, if you may. It's the guarantee that the problem of death and separation will be fixed by the God of life. Death is all around us. I have laid too many people to rest in my life as a pastor. I don't want to do it anymore. It's, it, it, it wears on you. It, it's very discouraging. You have, when you've laid as many people to rest as I have, and in your family as, to, as well, uh, you don't enjoy the thought of not being uh, reunited with them. But if you haven't, 
<laughs> already lost loved ones, you will because it is inevitable. I value Christ's death and resurrection to life because I want to see my loved ones again and my friends again. There's no resurrection of Christ. There's no resurrection of those that we love. I want to see my loved ones and friends again. A brother who bled to death on an operating table. 21 pints of blood, but they couldn't save him. A godly mother who was taken from us by an aneurysm who was gone in just minutes and to whom I was never able to say goodbye. To a brother-in-law, a powerful evangelist and preacher taken by a brain tumor. Cousins to cancer. Um, grandparents to heart attacks and disease, other loved ones. Multitudes of friends in the faith for whom I have said the last words, or dear friends who clung to me in tears when the doctor came out of the emergency room and reported that their loved one did not make it. I want comfort to the bereaved, hope to the heavy heart, promise to the lonely and devastated. The Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection gives us that hope. I think this is what Paul means in this text, that some... Uh, misinterpret about being baptized on behalf of the dead. What he's really saying is, is that people are baptized into the household of faith because they wish to see their loved ones again. It isn't the only reason, but it's a good one. The Bible's full of promise that God will resurrect those faithful who are dear to us. The resurrection of Christ is the surety of this hope. A third reason why I would... Uh, not want to uh, not believe in the resurrection is it would leave us with no heavenly home or destination. I admit I'm kind of hoping on more than just being raised. There's a universe to explore, questions to determine, sights to see. I have so many questions I want answered. I don't want just to be raised. I want to go somewhere. I want a destination. I want heaven. God isn't going to just raise his saints to just float around on a cloud. He has a home for them, an incredible place that the eye cannot, ear, eye and ear can't fathom today. If Jesus isn't raised, then 14, John 14, 1 to 3 is an empty promise. God isn't preparing a room for you in his house to be only a corpse, a hold for dry bones. He wants you to have life and that more abundantly. Have you ever received in jest a beautifully wrapped present, an elegant box complete with ribbons and wrappings, and when you opened it, there was nothing in it? I have. There's sort of a sinking feeling, especially if you had something particular in mind. You ask, is this all there is? It's empty. Well, Paul says it's like this with the resurrection. If there isn't any uh, resurrection, our faith is in vain. Literally, it's empty. It's an empty faith. All talk and no action. But... It's not that way. God has a place for you. He says he has a room already made out with your name and a whole lot more. If Christ isn't risen, there's another reason that um, we would be disappointed and we would be missing. And that is that there would be no Christian faith or church. If Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, we wouldn't have our church like we have, but we wouldn't have a denomination like we have. We wouldn't have... Uh, the church as we know it. If Jesus had not come back to life, there never would have been a Christian church. It is the rock of Jesus' life of salvation that the church is built on. Our faith, faith has a resurrected Lord. That's where it comes from. I would hate to be without my church, God's church, the body of Christ in the world. The church is my life. It is where my friends are. It's where I worship. It's what develops my piety. It's what makes this world a little heaven on earth, at least some of the time. It's a grace place. I think if the Christian church wasn't in our world, we humans would have probably blown ourselves up by now. We would have killed each other. Fletcher Christian, uh, mutiny on the bounty story in the Pitcairn uh, Islands, stranded on, you know, they were stranded on this island in the Pacific, a group of desperate, selfish men. It was like a microcosm of the greater world, and it shows you what happens if we were only ruled by uh, greed and hate. And there they existed on this island, island, fighting each other through the days for food, for mastery, and everything. Eventually, left uh, to their own sinful devices, they killed each other, and it got down to one man, 
Fletcher Christian. What a name, Fletcher Christian. But he wasn't really a Christian until he came across a book called the Bible. And he began reading that book and became one. His heart was changed. He saw the need of his Savior and Lord and submitted his life to him. From that time forward, the island grew back and later became an island upon which every inhabitant was a faith-believing Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I've heard that that has passed on now as far as the island isn't really inhabited, but I'm told that history, as it changed that island, what a difference it makes when people believe in love and grace sourced through Jesus Christ. It makes all the difference in the world. Without the resurrection, there would be no Christian faith. If Christ was not raised, there would be no Christians, no Easter, no Thanksgiving either, probably no, a lot of the things. I am so thankful that we serve a li living Savior. I'm glad that we can celebrate the, the resurrection and not be left where the world is, the, you know, ha happy uh, equinox or whatever. We have such much, so much more. If there were no resurrection, the fifth reason is there would be no hope of the second coming. No second coming? Yeah, no second coming. Think about it. What is the second coming for? What is its purpose? It is for Jesus to come and receive us unto himself. Some ask, well, do you Adventists believe in the resurrection? You bet we do. <laughs> we believe in the resurrection like nobody else. We think there's actually a necessary reason for it. If you die and go to heaven and your spirit is already spirit, what purpose is there in coming back to take us to heaven? To reunite the body and soul? What is that about? That's flimsy. Please, friends, see how illogical it is if you don't follow the Bible way. God is smarter than that. He doesn't come back to paste us back together. He comes back to resurrect us. Not a fake resurrection, a real one. Do we believe in the resurrection? We are only ones that really believe truly in the resurrection. Jesus says it's like a seed in the ground. The seed seems dead. It does not move. It does not grow or sprout. Though once it dies and is buried in the ground, something happens. The rain falls. The sun comes out. Pretty soon you have a bud, a sprout. Supposedly, some seeds of various kinds have been found in the tombs of the Egyptian kings like Tutankhamun kings who desperately tried to ensure their future, but their hope was an empty one because they were not built on Christ. Whole pyramids were built to help them to heaven, but they never got there. They're still there in, in their tomb. They're buried in their own tombs, lost in darkness with their belongings. They went nowhere. Deep within these colossal tombs have been found a few tiny seeds, seeds placed there at their burial. There they have rested for thousands of years, sometimes in the very hands of the people who hold, who hold the flowers uh, that have died in this place devoid of light, separated from the power of the Son of God. No moisture, no nourishment, no light. But now, thousands of years later, they have brought some of these seeds out and placed them in the ground, and they've actually grown into gorgeous flowers. There's a poem that was written about this uh, story where these seeds were um, buried and that they turned into flowers. It's called 2,000 Years. I thought I'd just read it to you because it, it's, it's, it's kind of moving. Um, written by Mrs. S.H. Bradford. Uh, 2,000 years ago, a flower bloomed lightly in a far-off land. 2,000 years ago, its root was placed within a dead man's hand. Before the Savior came to earth, that man had lived and loved and died, and ever in that far-off time the flower had spread its perfume wide. Suns rose, years came and went, the dead hand kept its treasure well, nations were born and turned to dust while life was hidden in that shell. The shriveled hand is robbed at last, the root is buried in the earth, when, lo, the life long hidden there into a glorious flower burst forth. Just such a plant as that which grew from such a root when buried low, just such a bower in Egypt bloomed and died 2,000 years ago. Then will not he who watched the root and kept the life within the shell, when those he loves are laid to rest, watch o'er their buried dust as well? And will not he from neath the sod cause something glorious to arise? Aye, 
Though it sleeps through countless years, yet from that very dust shall rise. Just such a face as greets you now, just such a form as here we bear, only more glorious will arise to meet the Savior in the air. Then will I lay me down in peace when called to leave this veil of tears. For in my flesh shall I see God, even though I sleep 2,000 years. Thank God for the promise of the resurrection. If there's no resurrection, then the second coming is useless. But thank God he is coming again. It is the blessed hope. It is the resurrection story. And in it lies the power of life, new abundant life from the creator and the Lord of glory. There's another bullet. And that is with no resurrection, we would never see the end of pain and suffering. Think of it. No deliverance. Do you want to keep your old worn frame your frail body, your <laughs> drying and wrinkling skin, and all the things that we hate as growing old. But Revelation 21 says that's all going to get turned around. Without the resurrection of Christ, there would be no hope to, to rise above this pain and suffering, this veil of tears that we're in. Revelation 21 has um, several things, uh, actually seven things that will be no more, no old heaven, no old earth, no sea, no tears, no death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain. Uh, you know, we know that, you know, Obamacare and, and, and whatever care can't fix the, the problems that we have, our physical problems. But the resurrection promises that we can have new lives and new bodies. There's much hope in that. But I think the, the greatest thing that I would dread to be without is no living Savior. No living Savior. If we didn't have the resurrection of Christ, we would truly be of all men most miserable. We're ser if we're serving a dead God, think about it. Other religions are really serving a dead God. If we serve a dead God, then we are dead in our trespasses in sins. That's what Paul says. We are in a world without grace. Thank God, Jesus is alive. He's alive. He lives. Job says, I know my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Paul says, I wouldn't have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God take with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are fallen asleep, for the Lord himself, and we know that, you know, shall descend from heaven with a shout, and, you know, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. A corruptible is going to put on incorruption. Jesus says he's the resurrection of the life. He that believes in me, Jesus says, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And this is the will of him that sent me, that seeth the Son and believeth on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. I am the Alpha and the Omega, Jesus says, the first and the last. Behold, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forever. Amen. And have the keys of death and the grave. Praise the Lord, we live or we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. And um, we know that this is the truth. It would be a terrible thought. It is a terrible thought that there would be no the resurrection. There is a resurrection. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. We can believe that to whatever day God calls us to. Hallelujah. We serve a living Savior. He's coming back for us. May God bless each one of you to hang on to hope as we work through these days ahead that we have much hope to a place before our eyes and uh, we have a God who is the God of hope and will lead us safely through. Amen.